Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome all those of you who are watching the live stream and also those of you who watch later. Um, this is one of, I think, almost 700 programs that we've done since the pandemic began, and we've done a lot of live streams um, in addition to trying to bring live audiences in. But as you know, right now, it's a, it's a hit or miss. So uh, today we have David Badanis returning to the Commonwealth Club. We've had him several times over the years. And um, uh, David is coming to us directly from London, uh, and he has got a new book out, at least in the American edition, called The Art of Fairness, The Power of Decency in a World Gone Mean. Uh, David, welcome back to the Commonwealth Club. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you very much, sir. It really is a treat being here. So uh, speaking of COVID uh, and its effects on us, uh, we, you, you start your, your book and you, you frame your book inside the story of BioNTech and uh, the Turkish-German uh, couple who were responsible for that company and one of the best vaccines that we had in a short amount of time. And use this as an example to say, we don't always have to be bossy bosses uh, and, and, and intimidating bosses and, and just make everybody operate based on fear rather than something else. Uh, one other thing to, to, to frame this is that we're not, you're not suggesting that everybody become mushy, uh, you know, and sing kumbaya uh, in order to make things happen. Uh, you have a very nice uh, middle road uh, take on this, and the stories will make that clear. But let's talk about BioNTech. Yeah, well, basically, uh, you nailed it when you talked about the middle road. If there is a, uh, it was really a big thing two years ago to get racing on the vaccine. We know that it's been, you know, a great success story. But vaccines normally take five or 10 years and it, with no guarantee of success. Malaria was incredibly hard or still is hard. So nobody knew it was gonna work. The world was watching and many of the organizations that tried it totally failed. So it, exactly as you said about the, the middle path, if they'd gone too extreme, if they'd been really mild at this company in Germany and mm -hmm. said, you know, hey, everybody can do what they want. We're gonna, our job is just facilitate you. It would go, it would just fly in all sorts of directions. Plus, you would have lots of time wasters who just weren't doing anything useful. If, on the other hand, this uh, married couple, it was a, a German couple of Turkish ethnicity, if this married couple who ran it had been real bullies and hired, saying fierce non-disclosure agreements, strong top-down administration, they wouldn't have gotten any creativity from the people there. So I thought it was a perfect example of how you have to trace this middle path. In the short term, you can get by with the bullying. It can get some things done. But if you have a product almost finished, you can get it to roll out a little bit, but for something as massive as creating this vaccine for a new virus, uh, unheard of, using a new technology of messenger RNA, only that middle path worked. Yeah, I think people argue a lot about uh, different political systems, different economic systems in the world. Obviously, uh, the human race is engaged in an ongoing experiment of how to try to make life work for us. Um, and, and we've tried all different kinds of things over the, the millennium. Um, but it seems to me that the most important part not, is not the system so much as the set of incentives that are, are built into that system and, and how much they align with people's ability to be free enough to get what they want, or at least a lot of what they want, but not chaotic, because if it's chaotic, that's kind of even worse than, than a total authoritarian situation. So why don't you give a little bit of example about how they did this? Um, what, what, what's this middle ground? What did they give on and what were they uh, insistent about? Sure. So it went through, um, I, I found that uh, in the book, I talk about like, you know, 10 different people in different areas who managed to find this middle ground. And they all, they all do it in, in, in at least three areas. And the first area is listening. So this couple in Germany, you, they had to listen to the people under them. It turns out to get the abstract uh, one possible design for a, an mRNA vaccine. It's not that hard. You can actually uh, do it. I think I'll put up on my website how to get a design in 60 minutes. So you have many possible designs. The question is checking if they're good, and then of course, building it and implementing it. Uh, RNA is designed, uh, mRNA, it's, it's actually a little messenger in the body. It's designed to last a little moment and then disappear. Sort of like mm -hmm. the messages at the beginning of the old Mission Impossible films, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, <laughs> burns up. 
and uh, messenger RNA is so delicate that if you inject it into the body, even if it can, you know, instruct you to make a perfect, uh, uh, set up the system for the perfect antibodies against a, um, a, a virus, it'll dissolve before it gets into the cells. It'll dissolve in just moments. It's so delicate that if I take my uh, a laboratory glove off improperly, so the inside of the glove uh, appears uh, facing the outside and tiny bits of my skin flakes fall down onto a lab table, it'll kill the messenger RNA. So you have to have, you know, you, you have to be really careful in how to do it. So for listening, the guys, uh, the couple who were ahead of the firm, they came up with some tentative ideas for what the formula should be, what type of messenger RNA should be, but they didn't insist that that's what the firm was going to follow. Think of the glory that says, I came up with this. I want everybody to follow it. They said, this is a possibility. Now, mm -hmm. all the top scientists, we want you to inform us what you've come up with and why it might work well. We want the technicians to come up with their ideas for how to have good safety protocols, how to uh, carry it around. Maybe it might have to be incredibly cold with dry ice or something even stronger. You have to generate your ideas. So listening is really important. All this follows the, the, the middle ground that you mentioned, the famous golden mean from Aristotle. <laughs> they listened to everybody. Uh, the, the company was tiny compared to Pfizer or AstraZeneca, but it was about 800, 1,000 people. It was a big deal in Mainz, West Germany. Uh, Germany. That's where Gutenberg had his press 500 years ago. They used mm -hmm. to say that was the most exciting thing that ever happened there in that uh, town 500 <laughs> years before. But so this company was medium. If they listened to everybody's ideas, they'd be cascaded with ideas. And even worse, if they said, okay, we'll do that. Okay, now we'll do that. The company would race around in all directions. Again, if on the other hand, they were too bossy, wouldn't work either. So they would take in lots of information and people knew they were genuinely open to listening. And then the top people would make executive decisions, which would then be implemented. So in, in the realm of listening, they were nice and fair. You're gonna say? Yeah, uh, that, that uh, some of the ideas in the book that you mentioned that were really crucial were like, what kind of container to, to, to distribute it in and, and you know, how, how, how to preserve it since it's very delicate um, and make it, available so that you can actually distribute it. And obviously they have solved that problem. Hundreds of millions of these doses have been distributed in a very short amount of time. Um, and I thought that was very fascinating that they, on their team, they had engineers of all different kinds. And yes. They, yes. they listened and, to the, the best ideas, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, the listening work. So the people, the couple who ran it, they'd gone to you know, decent medical schools in Germany, but they weren't people from MIT or Imperial College London or Caltech or anything. And so people knew that if you were competent, you could be hired there. You didn't have to be the old boys network who'd gone to the right secondary schools and, and just a handful of top universities in the world. Uh, I think about 40 or 50% of the staff, including right at the senior level, was female. And it was uh, uh, racially, uh, ethnically from all over the world. None of that mattered. So they knew you weren't being judged in that matter. So the listening was really good. And then the second thing they did, the second out of these three main principles that really hold up was what sort of giving do you do? If you if you like give everybody the opportunity to do anything or give infinite resources to everybody, first of all, you'll go broke in business. You can't, <laughs> or in a family, you know, you can't give all attention equally to uh, uh, all kids all the time as much as they want. So I found you have to, in the first one, you, you listen without ego. And in the second one, you give by letting other people give. So what they would do, you know, if, you're, if somebody's really bossy to you, they get, what they get coming back, they get resentment. But if somebody is considerate to you and generous to you, they giving you a, a chance to open up and really wanting to see what you can do, what they get back is gratitude. And gratitude is a hugely powerful force. But remember that famous middle way. If they only did that, then nice people would come back, with sensible people would come back with good, plausible ideas. The technicians would feel delighted to be empowered. But you'd get a lot of people who would take advantage of it, who really mm -hmm. wouldn't wouldn't be fair that the free riders, the freeloaders, the people who are tired and stuff. So you have to audit. You have to make sure that, you know, guys, we're really open. We, we want your ideas and you're seeing we're using the ideas We're we're really hands on. If there was a problem with the refrigeration unit, this couple from the top would be right there. Not when there's cameras around, but because that was their nature, helping the refrigeration unit. If it was a problem getting through to somebody in marketing. They would get through with that. So they would give by letting others give, but they'd also give an audit. And then the final thing with all these, uh, this couple in particular, and also everybody I uh, profile in the book, the third technique that really makes fairness work, that makes that intermediate path work, is you defend by not over defending. So mm -hmm. you don't, if you say we're going to have security guards in every lab, because it's easy to steal a, a virus, a, a formula you can steal on a hard drive or you can just email it, you have to trust the people within reason. 
Um, so they put in, but if you trust too much, that's no good. The advantage mm -hmm. of there being the trusting and open and really used to the outside world is the all the engineers there and the scientists and the technicians, they all were used to dealing with other companies. Uh, once the, they realized, you know, we're going to have to test this on tens of thousands of people, that a small company in Germany can't do it, so they had to bring in Pfizer. Well, Pfizer mm -hmm. knew them. They, they started with Pfizer right before there were any contracts because they had a good track record. And their reflex was some things we can grow internally, uh, this biotech firm, but some things mm -hmm. we're going to have to listen to other people. Everybody there was used to making connections, getting alliances, finding friends outside the firm. Now, again, if you're naive about it, uh, you defend by not over defending, but you can't under defend either. They, you know, they, they were, uh, you couldn't just walk into a random lab there. They had very good mm -hmm. cybersecurity up because the mm -hmm. big players in the world, uh, some of the uh, foreign dictatorships would love to get in their computer systems and, uh, and steal stuff. So mm -hmm. they, they did it all. They, they listened without ego. They gave by letting other people give and yet also auditing, also having street smarts to audit. And then they defended by not over defending. So you get terrific buy-in and power. Oh, oh, there's also a motivation. You, you have to, what's the reason you want to uh, do things this way? And it turns out uh, one of the, uh, the married couple who ran it was uh, an immigrant from Turkey. The other one had been born as a child in, uh, in Germany. And they were from an ordinary background. The, the dad of uh, the, the main guy had worked on the Ford assembly line and stuff. And mm -hmm. they knew that most Germans are, these days are really easygoing. But there's a certain mm -hmm. subset, like in every country, who are really racist. Uh, two years after they founded their company, about 10 years ago or so, there was a book that was, it sold over a million copies in Germany. It was written by a, a guy from the central bank explaining he had a famous line. He said, when you let foreigners and Turks into your country, you lower the IQ. Yeah. Well, this group, they began sitting around their uh, kitchen table. They had a nice apartment, but not incredible, in January uh, two years ago. And uh, in November two years ago, they got FDA approval for the testing. Mm -hmm. um, they were, I think, were briefly, they had a valuation greater than that, that of Deutsche Bank. They were on the cover of Time magazine. The mm -hmm. FT named them couple of the year, which is not bad for uh, somebody who's supposed to lower the IQ of your host country. <laughs> uh, well, it's always, it's always a, a tempting to say that, that the immigrants are ruining everything. And, uh, you know, obviously America is supposed to be proof positive against it. But then we have plenty of people here uh, that say the same thing. So, um, you talked about giving before. Um, I'm going to come back to a couple of ideas that you mentioned during your, your, your talk there. Uh, you can't give too much, you said. And I, I think you know, a perfect example of that is if you said, well, our medical system will only be perfect uh, for the whole country if everybody can have whatever plastic surgery they want that will make them look the way they want to look for their whole life. Um, no questions asked. You know, that would sort of swamp uh, the system in no time at all, right? Totally. So what needs a sort of, a, uh, I don't know what the verb is, to, if somebody has street smarts, uh, how, how do we describe them? You just say they have street smarts. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you don't have infinite resources. You can't be taken uh, advantage of. But what you can do is you can liberate other people. So yeah, you can't say that about plastic surgery. We, we don't have the resources and some people would waste it and do silly stuff. Yeah. On the other hand, there's a lot of excellent uh, uh, reconstructive surgeons. I, I, I know a number in yeah. London where I work. And um, if you give them the chance and give them a little bit of funding and free time, yes, they can earn some money from uh, purely cosmetic surgery, which mm -hmm. sometimes is trivial, but sometimes is important. But when it comes to reconstructive surgery, especially of the face, they yeah. can do wonderful stuff and they need investment. And also they need the confidence that if they come up with possible new techniques or new approaches or ways to maybe uh, train paramedics in the third world, that they can mm -hmm. get support for that. If they know that that's a possibility at their hospitals or the research institutes, wonderful things happen. Yeah, exactly. Perfect idea about the middle way. Where is it useful? Where is it, you know, where is it going to be abused, et cetera, et cetera. That's there's really, really, uh, you know, no, nothing that humans do that can't be abused. So, <laughs> so uh, one other thing uh, to put, to try, which we won't succeed at, but to try to put an end to one of the myths uh, about the uh, vaccines, uh, you talked about how delicate mRNA is. So I am assuming that some kind of microchip that would take over our minds is not possible. You would not attach it to mRNA uh, if you were going to put it into the system because the whole thing would fall apart and not get anywhere. Yeah, it, uh, uh, so uh, DNA uh, X, uh, it's not exactly like a, an architect's blueprints, but it's sort of like an architect's blueprints. And DNA is quite stable. It's in the center of our cells, in the, the center of the nucleus. 
Uh, but of course, to affect, uh, to create the proteins that our body is built out of and makes things work and operate muscles and getting our brains working and all sorts of stuff, you need to transmit the information. Suppose there's a library somewhere where, uh, suppose you have a bunch of architects in your basement, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in the basement of a huge workshop in Detroit uh, or a Tesla's factory in, uh, where's it now? Texas, California. You have a bunch <laughs> of architects or designers. There has to be somebody who takes the, the architectural designs. Uh, now we actually use the internet which takes it, zooms through the fiber optic tubes uh, lines, and then puts it on the uh, table where the, where the actual engineers uh, start building the stuff. Now that message has to disappear as soon as it's used. Otherwise you get a pile up and pile up and pile up. So DNA is really stable. There's some parts mm -hmm. of DNA in our bodies that can, which is error correction, which really stay good for many, many years. Um, but the messenger stuff that comes out is transitory. It, it, it falls apart in, in, in a few moments. So mm -hmm. it turns out the way they get it to be stable, you wrap it in little balls of, uh, of sort of a, a lipid, li like oil. And that can, from the time it is injected, that little ball is like a little uh, submarine around this very delicate, delicate, delicate little uh, guy holding the, um, uh, the blueprints. And the submarine survives until it gets into like one of our cells. And then, you know, the, the whole thing uh, falls apart. Oh yeah, so, so if I were going to implant microchips in people, the simplest way would be to, implant microchips, get a hypodermic and implant microchips. On the other hand, if it works anything like, uh, you know, most uh, mass produced objects, it wouldn't work that well and there'd be high pricing. I don't think microchips is the way to go. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about the Empire State Building and that project because this is one of your examples of how um, doing it differently made a difference and how fast that building was built is also very amazing. So why don't you tell it's that astonishing. story? It's astonishing. So the Empire State Building, which from the 1930s to the 1970s was the tallest building on planet Earth. So it was designed in the 1920s. They started work, I think, in 1929. And by the time they finished, oh, oh so, so the how long did it take? I'm going to count the time from when somebody had a tentative idea to getting the architect's plans going uh, buying the previous building that had been there, which was the old Waldorf Astoria Hotel, demolishing a huge hotel in the central Manhattan when you couldn't close the streets, carting away everything from Giants Hotel, digging the foundations for a new building, ordering all the steel and the masonry, employing everybody, and then building the tallest building on earth before emails and before computer assisted design. It took from beginning to end 13 months. I have a leaky uh, 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 guest bedroom in my house on a flat <laughs> top of it. It's been taking over 13 months to get that leak finished. They did the <laughs> entire thing from beginning to end, including the planning in 13 months. You don't get that by yelling and screaming at people. Mm -hmm. It can't be done. Yeah. And, and uh, who was responsible for putting that um, personal touch on the whole project? Was one person involved or was it a group? Well, I got to tell you, there's, there's this terrible thing. If you come from the Midwest, as mm -hmm. some of us do, um, mm -hmm. you become really smug because you're convinced you're better than everybody else on earth. By the way, I found this not just the Midwest. I've been informed that people in other places of the country feel that way. <laughs> it happens in Britain. People from Yorkshire, when I told them like in a recent Olympics that if Yorkshire was a country, it would have been like seventh or eighth in the world in the medals. They said, uh. well, yeah, of course, we're Yorkshiremen. So everybody has. <laughs> Anyways. Me, a good Chicago and Ohio boy, for me, it's the Midwest. So there was a group of brothers, the Starrett brothers, uh, and they were led by, uh, the main one was Paul Starrett. And they were from Kansas and from Chicago. And they had solid Midwestern values. Um, and they knew exactly about the middle way. They knew if you yell and scream at people, you'll get work done, but nobody's gonna go the extra mile. You know, if it's getting close to 5 p.m., the contract for a worker goes to five, he downs his tools. And to be honest, if there's no foreman around, He'll be slowing down at three or four. Tools will go walk by they'll kind of disappear. Everybody's slow and sluggish. And if there's a process that's not working well, they're not gonna be very keen on, on pushing it. So they knew that if you're really bullying, you can get something done, but you have a resistant workforce. I mean, an mm -hmm. extreme example is during World War II, American mm -hmm. factories could have strikes and all sorts of stuff. And the workforce was terrific. You could adjust and get, after a strike, you're usually happier mm -hmm. with how things are. Germany, mm -hmm. of course, had a terrible, uh, grotesque uh, uh, slave labor in their factories and was much less productive, less mm -hmm. productive with the boss, your people. Uh, also, when the Empire State Building was going up there, it was America. And the, it, it, as the Depression was beginning, there were a lot of strikes all over the place. On the Empire State Building, the workers didn't strike. The mm -hmm. pay was about twice as high 
as almost every other building. Uh, around the same time, the, uh, the Chrysler building, a beautiful building, was mm-hmm. going up. And it was slower. It was taking longer. There was kind of a race. Um, Chrysler was slower. In New Jersey, a lot of skyscrapers or mini skyscrapers were going up. And there were labor disputes and arguments and the foremen were going nuts. The Empire State Building sh- just went like this. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so Paul Sterrett, the guy who was running it, he explained to the uh, financial powers behind it. He said, look, I'm going to take this different approach. I'm going to double the salaries. I'm going to give people really good uh, uh, working conditions. If it's windy, they don't have to come. I'm going to try to make sure that not a single person dies on site. You know, it's, you know, the famous picture of people eating on exposed beans. It's dangerous mm-hmm. at the time. I'm also going to take into account that, you know, our workers, they're immigrants from around the world, and many of them have low salaries. And in almost every other construction site at the time, in the 1920s, when there was a skyscraper boom, um, uh, the workers at lunchtime would have to take a break, go all the way down the building on their own time, or find a toilet somewhere on the ground floor. Uh, or try to find a cafe or a restaurant or a park bench where they could eat and then go back in and climb back up. So, inst- and, and it was pricey, a, a meal each time. And you couldn't always guarantee a paper bag, a, a meal would work. So he had subsidized restaurants on about every uh, third or fourth floor as it was going up. One of the great things when I was researching this chapter, I found somebody had discovered the original, um, uh, uh, I think it was a photocopy. Um, I can't remember the, the technology they used it was before uh, mm-hmm. Xerox machines. But there were the, uh, the, the, the plans of the actual uh, production engineers, about 80 or 90 pages, which hadn't been seen for decades. It had been hidden away and described mm. all the detailed process. So there were these uh, nice men, uh, restaurants where you could have sauerkraut and root beer and all sorts of stuff. There were toilets put up. So there mm. was these good conditions. Now, remember the thing about going to extremes if give, you know, by letting other people give, um, but you have to audit. So just to make sure that people didn't say, we are an easy street, baby. The Sterrett mm-hmm. brothers who are running this, the contractors, they're pushovers. We get good pay and don't have to do anything. Instead of that, well, we th- today think of auditors as people sit quietly behind computer screens. Uh, on the Empire State Construction, the auditors had shoulders like, Whoa, like a gorilla. <laughs> but the auditors, they had several dozen, and their job was to clamber through the entire construction site twice each day, just in mm-hmm. a nice, polite, friendly way, not being uh, bossy and stuff just checking that everybody was where they were supposed to be and doing their work. Mm -hmm. And it was a fair contract. People Mm -hmm. realized, okay, on this side, I work hard and they check I work hard. And in exchange, they give me what in uh, economics is called efficiency wages. They're giving Mm -hmm. me double the salary. And because the Starrett's had this ethos, like we're gonna get things done and we're gonna treat you uh, decently. The workers came up with all sorts of innovations. Uh, You know, the Empire State Building has those beautiful, shiny aluminum uh, lines going up, the famous Art Deco and stuff. Yeah. Well, that, was a, that was an innovation that came up uh, uh, during the planning. Uh, it turns out it's really expensive to get big sheets of stone and to get the edges really neat, the, the, the stone facing of the building and getting them to align. So if you have sort of rough stone that doesn't quite align, if you cover it with cheap bits of aluminum just bolted on, then nobody can tell that it wasn't really, it's kind of mm-hmm. okay. So our famous beautiful Art Deco came as an innovative idea from below to uh, save money and time. All sorts of things. The, the workers developed uh, little conveyor belts and miniature trains to carry the bricks around and dozens of tiny innovations. And they thought, you know, in Britain, there's this phrase uh, uh, using the Cockney accent. People say, he's a fair cop. You know, somebody who arrested me, I didn't want to be arrested, but, you know, I did a criminal deed. It's fair. So here they're saying, you know, they send the auditors around, but they're, they're fair people. They give us these great mm-hmm. conditions. And in exchange, mm-hmm. creativity flourished. You know, World War II is another example where all kinds of things were created quickly uh, in America and plenty of other places and some places not so well and other places not, uh, you know, much better. And the question, of course, is how, why, what the motive was during a war of people are obviously motivated uh, without any kind of other incentive uh, just to, to, to try to protect their civilization. But you have, you have a lot of good examples of how fast um, things were created and how many items were given like to the Soviet Union by the United States. Why don't you cover a little bit of that? Oh, sure. And uh, just to show that it's really up to date. So this is now like two generations ago. We're talking the early 1940s. Uh, Many young people are just vaguely aware of, they just know a few photographs. Uh, Since the the COVID, uh, the coronavirus was discovered in China, uh, well, uh, about two years ago, 
um, two years have passed and we've had a certain amount of progress around the world, good things like vaccines, uh, problems in, in many countries, which we know well. Uh, two years into World War II, the U.S. had pretty much turned the corner. So the U.S. Mm. entered World War II at the end of 1941. So you could say like beginning of 1942. Two years later, which is the equivalent of where we are now compared with the beginning of the vaccine, January 1944, it was pretty much guaranteed the Allies would win with the U.S. being one of the really central pushes with clearly uh, mm. Russia and Britain really helpful. That's just two years. So compare that with what's going on in these two years with our much wealthier countries uh, with the coronavirus. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's no comparison. Uh, before the U.S. began uh, in, the, in early December, before the U.S. entered the war, in early December 1941, Germany seemed obviously triumphant. There were Nazi forces from the uh, uh, gates of Moscow all the way to the English Channel, the whole width of Europe. They mm -hmm. stretched from the Arctic Circle, the tip of Norway, all the way down to the Sahara. And it was clear that it was the dominant force. Uh, 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 Hitler and Goebbels, who I talk about at great lengths, especially mm -hmm. Joseph Goebbels, uh, the propaganda minister, he said, look, uh, America, he used this terrible phrase. He said, it was, you know, it's run by blacks and these religious groups uh, who he looked down on. And uh, he was just, he said, how could they ever unite? How could all this, mm -hmm. this country of disparate immigrants who were clearly not all Aryans, how could they uh, pull together? Well, mm -hmm. As we know, this country mm -hmm. pulled together really well. Uh, uh, Goebbels wrote in one of his uh, diaries that the Italians were terrible allies of the Germans. They didn't really work, want to work with us. Of course not. Italian farmers are really smart. The literal brothers and cousins of those Italian farmers formed about estimated 8 to 10 percent of the United States armored forces in uh, Normandy uh, mm -hmm. in 1944, which destroyed the Wehrmacht. They destroyed the German army. These mm -hmm. exact same people. It wasn't because you're Italian or you're Irish or whatever it is, it's who mm -hmm. you're motivated to join, who you want to work with. So mm -hmm. the opportunities were open. Factories transformed in America. Uh, there was a, um, uh, I think, a maple forest uh, outside of um, a Detroit, which um, was just trees in 1940, 1941. Two and a half years later, two years later, it was one of the largest factories on planet Earth. And it was making a heavy bomber about every 63 uh, minutes, every 63 mm -hmm. minutes. Raw material, the famous iron from uh, the Minnesota and stuff would be coming in and these bombers would be coming out. And this mm -hmm. is utterly transformative. And you don't get that by yelling and screaming at people, uh, Irish people and black Americans and um, uh, Hungarians and everybody was pulling together uh, because they were, on the whole, there were many uh, problems. It wasn't perfect. Studs Terkel mm -hmm. has a great interview book about it and there's many others. Uh, but on the whole, people were uh, treated fairly. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the president, Franklin Roosevelt, was really humiliated and embarrassed that when he brought in uh, Social Security in 1935 to get support from the Southern senators, he had to restrict it so that very few Black Americans were covered. And that, mm -hmm. was, that violated all of his sympathies. So he made a point when the contracts came in for World War II that there had to be the sort of affirmative action, that there had mm -hmm. to be fair, fair contracts for everybody independent of color. And it helped mm -hmm. jumpstart a Black middle class in Los Angeles and, and, and around the country. And people, mm -hmm. people respond really well to that. And again, there was auditors and teams of auditors. There was some corruption in the uh, contracts, but not that much. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly not as much as, as, as in some, some other countries. And the output was transformative. The famous, uh, so the US entered the war in December, 1941. Within a year, in autumn of 1942, it's like something had spread so in, in Russia, there's the Battle of Stalingrad, which took the upper limit of the German expansion and the Russians managed to push back. They won, of course, because you don't want to mess with the Russian army, but the Red Army was also successful because they had tens of thousands of really tough Detroit made trucks driving them around. They had radios, mm -hmm. they had a lot of aviation fuel and stuff. They did the work, but without that, they couldn't have done it. At the same time, in, in, the, in the autumn of, uh, uh, of 1942, the Brits managed to like stop the maximum German advance in Africa, just outside of, uh, uh, of Alexandria and Cairo, you know, not that far from the main bits of Egypt and push it back. And I think it was either the third or fourth battle of El Alamein with terrific American tanks. Again, the work was done by really tough uh, British and uh, Commonwealth uh, soldiers, but without this terrific outpouring that came from America, they couldn't have done it. And mm -hmm. it came from America, not by uh, FDR or other people having brutal, brutal rules. Uh, but it came because people had sense of buy-in. They were treated fairly. Uh, workers, because of the unions, could be listened to. Really terrible conditions could, uh, could be improved. 
there's this feeling we're open to ideas from around the world. Uh, there's a young man in Germany named Ernest Chain, a Jewish guy in his mid twenties. He lived in, I think he was in Berlin and he was working on biochemistry and stuff. If Germany had treated him fairly, he would have stayed in Germany and worked for even a militaristic a government. He probably would have. But the Germans said, you're Jewish, we hate you. His family was attacked. Uh, female siblings would be, uh, relatives would be beaten down on the street. He would be cursed, kicked out of his job. So he managed to get to the allied countries. And so he was one of the key minds behind penicillin. And so mm -hmm. it was the allied troops that got penicillin. He was willing to go there. Uh, the famous mm -hmm. Battle of Britain, where uh, Britain defended itself against a German impossible invasion in uh, September 1940. Great RAF pilots. Not all of them were English. A lot of mm -hmm. them were Polish. A lot of them were Czech. A lot of them were from South Africa. A lot of them were from Australia. There were Canadians, a few Americans, apparently even Ben Affleck, according to a certain film, uh, got <laughs> it. It was open to talent. Goebbels kept on writing in his diaries and his journals, how come everybody hates us? We don't get any uh, uh, gratitude from these countries we've invaded and are keeping down. To yeah. which you can only say, quoting the great philosopher, Homer Simpson, duh, nobody likes, <laughs> you. Nobody likes Goliath. They might have to respond to Goliath, but nobody likes Goliath. I think this is uh, partially, uh, you know, supported by what people do with the language that was imposed on them. Uh, Russian was dumped out of all of the schools uh, in Eastern um, Europe right after the collapse. And just they didn't want to hear it again. But English is still spoken all over the place, and, and the British and the Americans have done lots of stupid stuff. Um, uh, but that, but they haven't been as authoritarian to the point where you just, you know, you just can't stand the people. I think that nails it because that's kind of an objective measure. If I, you could say, oh, Bodanis is a quiet writer sitting in this book line study. He can say whatever he wants. I'm not convinced the world's a rough place. But mm -hmm. if you find that these principles, finding that middle line of fairness, uh, which you, you can call a uh, firm but fair, you find mm -hmm. that, wow, that makes allied forces more effective in World War II against this great evil. That's really mm -hmm. impressive. If you find the example you gave is, is actually a great one. Um, mm -hmm. Why do people in those countries, in Eastern Europe and all around the world, why do they choose to learn English rather than uh, Russian? You could say, well, it's you know, the international language, which is to some mm. extent true, but then why do they want to go to high school exchanges in America or go mm. to university or postgraduate stuff, uh, a graduate stuff in America mm. rather than in Russia? There's a notion that even though America is really not perfect and you get old boys networks and rich boarding schools and you know, blah, mm. blah, blah, you get all that, there's still this notion of fairness. There's still this notion that if you, you know, if you qualify and there's all these systemic problems, but if you manage to push through that, or it's not quite so bad in some areas, mm -hmm. you can nail it. You can rise up and get connected and be treated decently. Even, mm -hmm. can you imagine what it's like? It's like a biblical exodus, pushing through some of the borders with your family, with no resources. Imagine mm -hmm. trying to get a, make a living in San Francisco without a high school degree and no mm -hmm. work record. There's hundreds of thousands of people who are willing to try it and they really, mm -hmm. really work. Very few of those people will go to Russia if they have the opportunity. There's mm -hmm. a feeling that, oh, I could rise in Russia by making friends with an oligarch or making friends right. with the uh, dictator. But if I just have a good idea and really push hard on it, it's going to be appropriated. It's going to be taken over. That's why many people leave their own poor countries. In no mm -hmm. way are the people in those countries inferior or lazy. My God, they're not lazy at all. But mm -hmm. they know that they won't be treated fairly. Think if you've ever been in a, a bad company or a bad relationship. You want to sell. Mm -hmm. Right. You're going to be like that. I'll go on. Uh, I'll go on strike. Doesn't work. <laughs> exactly, and I, I think uh, you know part of the application of your your uh, explication of how clear this is uh, is very useful to America now because uh, all of our manufacturing has moved out of the United States. Not all of it, but such a large portion of it that we were so good at, and people are afraid now we're dependent on everybody else, and and this is scary, et cetera, et cetera, to to, to not be able to do this anymore. But we can do it. We know how to do it. We could, if, if we were forced into the situation, America could, in two or three years, have manufacturing plants of, you know, you know, top technology and everything, all rebuilt in America, you know, if, if that was necessary. If it's not necessary, why do it, right? Well, uh, that's one of the, the great arguments for clean energy, uh, totally aside from the environmental arguments, which, of mm -hmm. course, the environment is a very, very strong argument. You can transmit, especially with, especially with use direct current, you can transmit mm -hmm. electricity pretty far. Uh, the mm -hmm. south of uh, England gets a lot of its electricity through cables uh, that come from France under the English Channel, which is really impressive. Mm -hmm. 30 miles, 40 miles, some of them uh, uh, can be longer. 
uh, France has extra electricity, but you can't really, at the moment, we can't transmit it across, uh, uh, from continent to continent. Mm -hmm. So the new construction for clean energy is gonna be in America. It's gonna mm -hmm. be the huge, huge wind turbines, really big ones, powerful ones, mm -hmm. you know, maybe deep offshore. Engineers love this sort of stuff. You know, no mm -hmm. engineer for BP or Shell or Exxon, they don't like coming home and having their teenage kids say, hey dad, what have you done to destroy and burn off the planet recently? They, they, <laughs> and of course they don't like it. But engineers will build what they're uh, asked to build and what they have the resources for. Mm -hmm. I can build an oil refinery, I can build a, a oil drilling, or I can take that offshore platform, say in the Gulf of uh, uh, Mexico, mm -hmm. and I can put wind, wind blades on top of it, big ones, mm -hmm. blades longer than a you know, modern jet's wing. I've been informed that in parts of Northwestern Texas, the wind blows and blows and blows, and that's on a quiet day. On a windy mm -hmm. day, it gets worse. Uh, <laughs> so there's great opportunities for this, and this will be jobs within America. It's really, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really very impressive. Great opportunity. Well, let's go to another one of your World War II stories, which I found very interesting. I think, uh, if I got the name right, Graham Browers, the, the, the British debutante. Uh, yeah. Tell her story. It's such, it's such a great story. This, this was such a surprise. Uh, so some of the people I wrote about in the book, I had known about Franklin Roosevelt, Joseph Goebbels, I'd known a bit, but Ursula Graham Bowers, I had never heard of. Anyways, I can start, should I start at the beginning when she was ordinary or at the end when she yeah, was ordinary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start where she's okay, ordinary. Start at the beginning. Okay, there was a girl who was brought up in the 19 teens and 1920s in London in the South Kensington neighborhood. It was kind of like the Upper East Side of Manhattan. A lot of snooty, rich people living there and stuff. <laughs> thing called debutante balls. You were supposed to go to debutante balls to meet a proper boy from a proper background, and you, the woman, would sit on a sofa, maybe with a cigarettes and a and a cigarette holder and holding champagne, and you would tell the servants what to do, and you would never do anything in your whole life. Anyways, Ursula thought, "Don't like that. I'm mm. not interested in that." Her mother wanted her to be like that, but Ursula, she wasn't fat. She was a little bit chubby. And the mother said, oh, dear, you'll never dress as well as me. Oh, I'm very disappointed in you. But her father was a Royal Navy commander, and he loved his daughter. She wasn't a detente boy, but he just treated her as a, as a person. They used to do rifle shooting and pistol shooting and get on horses and stuff. But then as she became a teenager, 14, 15, 16, society's consensus in the 1930s was just really strong. It's really hard to fight your group. Oh, her mother would say, you know, you don't really look good in those ball gown dresses, but I suppose we'll have to send you to the to the balls anyway. She didn't like that. So she escaped. Oh, and by the way, she was a good student in high school uh, mm -hmm. and she wanted to go to university to study anthropology. And her mother said, darling, it's not for women, really. Yeah. We have fun. So your cousin, your male cousin could go. So for a little while in London, they gave her a bit of money and she got a racing car. And she became a fairly decent uh, rally driver, just informal rallies, and including mm -hmm. doing the mechanics on. Her mother just didn't like it. And poor Ursula, she couldn't stand this. She didn't hate her mother. She realized her mother had limited background. So she went off to the northeastern part of India, right where it borders, what was then called Burma, what is now Myanmar. Uh, for simplicity, should I use the word Burma or Myanmar as we chat now? Burma is fine because that's what it was at the okay. time. Yeah, I'll use Burma, which is the name now, which is no disrespect for the uh, the, the modern shift uh, in the name. So right. she was there. And at the beginning, she hung out with the, the wealthy uh, uh, English expatriate crowd where the men, boys would play polo and the girls would try to swoon at the men playing polo. She was <laughs> out of her mind. She said, oh my God, this is like South Kensington with more mosquitoes and jungle around us. This is not <laughs> an attractive place to be. So then some of them said, there, you know, there's charming jungle around here and there's most curious natives. Let's go on a motor car journey into the jungle. Mm -hmm. So she went with some of the people a little bit into the jungle and they said, oh, look, these primitives. And she thought, these are human beings around here. So mm -hmm. when her friends went back to the, uh, to the British uh, clearings, she arranged to stay. And she arranged to stay with what were called the Naga people, N-A-G-A. -A. Uh, and it was, a, it was really tough land. It's the highlands that come down from uh, Tibet. So the language they spoke was a little bit like India, the Indian languages, Hindi and stuff, but also a little bit like Chinese, Tibetan languages, kind of in between. Mm -hmm. She learned the language and at the beginning, the people weren't mean to her, but they didn't really trust her. She was this sort of rich outsider. She said, oh, I will make friends. I will give you free food. Well, they were really scared because the last time somebody had given them free food was um, a, a real jerk uh, from the British uh, authorities who gave them what seemed to be free uh, rice and grain. And then after they used it, oh, by the way, there's a 120% interest uh, compound payable now. If you don't, mm -hmm. pay it, uh, oh, you don't have cash, do you? We'll take over your land. So they were really mm -hmm. apprehensive. So if she gave medicines, it's like some sort of 
weird white savior coming in. She didn't want to be a part of that. So she spoke to some of the people where she was staying with, and she said, look, I really want to learn your language and be connected. They didn't trust her. And there's one thing that she gave, which allowed herself to be connected. You know, in basketball, you can fake with your hands, you can fake with your eyes, you know, you can fake yeah. with your legs. You cannot fake with your lower abdomen, where your chest and your lower abdomen moves. That's where your body is moving. If, and, and good defenders know to look that way. They won't get taken away with a head fake. They look where the center of gravity is going. So what's the equivalent for Ursula? She said, I'm going to sign a document and I'm going to say that I am now under your local tribal law. If something comes up, a disagreement about housing, a disagreement about health, disagreement about uh, anything, a tax, whatever it could be, your law will dominate. I cannot go to any British court or bring in any British authorities. Mm -hmm. Nobody had ever done that. And at that point she was connected. She lives in a local village and she also had humility to say, okay, these people don't have our technology. They don't have internal combustion engines, but they mm -hmm. really know how the land works. They really know how to cross streams at the right point with the right sort of stones. They know how the local herbs are incredibly effective for this disease versus that. And you know what? They know how to construct houses that are much better in uh, these heavy tropical rains than the expensive aluminum uh, sheeting that I would bring in. So she really connected. And then uh, uh, right after uh, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor in, in December, 1941, uh, Japan, as you know, expanded all through Southeast Asia. And a little bit after that, they were going into uh, what was then called Burma. And there was a small British army in Burma then, uh, Britain uh, ran Burma. Was, uh, they were fairly good with increasing local legislators, legislation, uh, le local um, uh, legislative institutes for the, uh, for the locals, but it was, still, it was still run by Britain. So the British army was there and they failed terribly. The British commander, a man named William Slim, wrote a book called Defeat into Victory. And it begins mm -hmm. by saying, in 1942, we were miserable and disgraced ourselves and our country and our nation and our empire because basically they ran away for hundreds of miles from the Japanese who are always better than them. It's like better at bridge building, better at night attacks, better at going to the side. And an exhausted British army survived just barely crossing the Chindwin River and getting into Northeastern uh, India. Mm -hmm. Northeastern India is a really important area. If you control the rail lines there, uh, you control possible resupplies to China, which is fighting Japan. Mm -hmm. And it opens down into a plane that opens up all of India in front of you. So a little corner of northeastern uh, uh, India was a really important, like a choke point. If you can get through there, you really get through. Anyways, uh, in 1944, uh, Japan really pushed into that area uh, with a big full front. And General Slim, who now had built up a fairly large army, was ready to, uh, to push back and fight. But he had to know what was going on behind Japanese lines. And it was really hard to do because there were a handful of people who he trusted uh, a, a British a, a colonial or administrative officials, and they were generally turned into the Japanese and, and, and killed because the mm -hmm. locals thought, look, it's your war. What, what are we doing here? We're going to try to stay out of the way. Um, but Ursula Graham Bauer was different because the people mm -hmm. trusted her. She was a medium-sized woman, wasn't tall, wasn't short, medium weight. She didn't have a gun. She didn't have money. But she said what she had was something much more powerful. She had loyalty because she had given by letting other people's give. They had seen that she had respected their language and respected their culture, not in the sense of wearing like a, a little skirt that they was their style or, or knowing mm -hmm. a few words to talk to the servants, but by, by, by living there and learning, my God, your agricultural techniques are terrific. These mm -hmm. storage procedures you have, I had no idea about them. What you understand about herbal medicine is something we're just trying to reach in the West. It was real respect. So they did what she wanted. And she formed a group of about 115, 125 um, uh, scouts. And uh, then the question is, how do you scout in this huge jungle area behind enemy lines? Um, and so Slim's people uh, 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 on the lowlands, they sometimes, they tried to send in some soldiers climbing up through the mountains and hills through the jungle to bring crates of guns. And they said, oh, we have some ideas for how to administer and how to uh, do proper scouting. She said, hmm. let's see what my friends here have to say. Well, it mm -hmm. turns out the Naga tribesmen were probably the best in the world. As you can imagine, this is where they lived for millennia or at mm -hmm. least centuries. They knew how to scout there. So they formed interesting geometric formations. They would distribute the scouts in this way. They'd have a few central nodes. Information and runners would go from the outside to the central nodes. Then going back to headquarters. And uh, Ursula kept their respect. She could pass out the rifles and uh, machine guns and stuff that came from British Army headquarters. But she had them lead everything. 
And a few times if they said, look, here's a, 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 a road that the Japanese have to take, but we can only see it from the certain hill, she'd say, I'll climb that hill with you. And she described mm -hmm. in a memoir she wrote after uh, the war, I found covered in dust at the British Library on St. James's Square, and it all came alive. She said, I wasn't gonna let them down. She was exhausted climbing through the humidity and the, the there were thick butterflies, which are fine. There were mosquitoes, which was less fine. And a lot of the fit young men from the British army there, uh, they couldn't do the climb, she did. And the people mm -hmm. rejected her. At one point, everybody said, oh, we have to leave and go back to our villages for 36 hours. And she thought, oh, I've done something wrong. They came back after 36 hours. What they had done was written their wills and arranged for other people to take over if they died. And she mm -hmm. gave invaluable intelligence. At one point, I quote in the book uh, an account from uh, General Slim's headquarters where there was a new officer there who said, ha, there's some sort of woman who's sending a, a secret coded radio message from the jungle, a woman running our information lines. And Slim said, don't laugh. She's the best we have. And she was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great story. So uh, before we leave uh, World War II, though, and, and get to Leo de Rocher, <laughs> Uh, that's a great that's a great uh, transition. <laughs> um, I want you to talk a, a little bit. Uh, I mean, I, I, everyone should read the book about uh, these stories because the way you contrast uh, Goebbels and, and Roosevelt is just wonderful. And what they had in common also was very interesting. Yeah, and so I, that, I think you should. Yeah. Just, yeah, that's a crucial part. And also the, the, the fact that Goebbels wasn't quite who he was later when he was young. Uh, so if you can give a little bit of that thing and, and, and who was interested in their lives? Yes. Uh, his, yeah. The girlfriends, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, see that was really striking. And so in this yeah. book, I tried to keep out people like uh, Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela or Mother Teresa. We know mm -hmm. that there's some human beings who are just superior to us. They're just ethically mm -hmm. good human beings. And uh, if there was a book about them, you say, well, this is lovely models, but I can't do it in my real life. I was really struck by fallible people and also how people change, how people mm -hmm. transform and change. So we now think of Goebbels as a representative of all evil. And later in his life, he was. He was the propaganda minister who really encouraged the roundup of uh, little Jewish children in London, not just adults who might be uh, some conceivable possible threat, which they weren't, but little children and making sure that all the children were found so they could be murdered. And uh, mm -hmm. it, as the uh, German forces went to Eastern Europe, it really was very important with him that all the children were killed. It's like, it's like from beyond a horror film. We can't believe mm -hmm. it happened, but still at the edge of living memory. But when he was younger, he was different. Uh, he'd grown up, um, Joey, as his friends called him, a, a shorthand. He'd grown up in a small town in, in the west of uh, Germany, right not far from the French border. Um, and um, he went to university and he studied uh, literature and he actually did a doctorate with a, a Jewish supervisor who was really nice to him and who he liked. I had the misfortune of, uh, of reading most of his doctorate. It's, mm -hmm. The world did not lose that much when he didn't become a professor. <laughs> um, then he went back to his old hometown in Western Germany. This is like the 1920s and stuff. And he was living at home and he was in his early mid twenties, 23, 24, 25, and he was really depressed. Kind of like now, you know, you're you're back at home, you're staying on the sofa, or maybe in the child the childhood bedroom. Everybody else in your family is out having a job. You you can't you don't have a mortgage, you don't have an apartment, you don't have a job. You're really down and out. You think, oh God, they don't appreciate me. At that, and point, he has a disability too. Uh, yes, yes. So he was born with a a, a, a very damaged one leg, uh, uh, ankle was quite damaged. It's the sort of thing that could be fixed now, but he walked with an extremely pronounced limp. On YouTube, there's a few clips of him walking and he had a, a really strong limp and, and he was quite small. Well, it turned out he had a vicious tongue. He was, uh, they, kids tried to bully him at school, as you could imagine, before the mm -hmm. First World War. And he learned to just fight back with vitriol and quick wit. Um, mm -hmm. So he was kind of a nasty, unpleasant, but he wasn't this mass murderer. Anyways, he met a girl who he really liked named Elsie Yanka when he was uh, in, in his mid twenties. He was about as old as the century. And it uh, turned out she was Jewish. She was a school teacher in the town, which was sort of one level above uh, his family. And she was really nice. And I managed to find and quote from in this book, his journal from the time, mm. letters that they wrote, love letters. And including, she got him a, um, she got him a, a blank diary where he was gonna write his improvements in life. And he mm -hmm. wrote things like, I'm so thankful to Elsa for believing in me. She'd come over and she'd sit with Mrs. Goebbels and talk about you know, how to make Joey happier. He, he, he liked playing the piano. He'd have to put a, a big thick piece of wood under his right foot, which is mm -hmm. a bit shorter than his, his right leg, so he could press the pedals. But he was decent. She, she'd buy him Schubert and stuff. 
and uh, he started doing pre- uh, push-ups in the morning. He, I think he uh, you know, put ointments on his hair so he'd be more lustrous. And he said, you know, this anti-Semitism is, is really overrated. It's an excuse for inadequate people. If the plays, he, he wanted to be a playwright, if the plays I'm writing haven't been accepted at the important theaters in Berlin and Stuttgart, it's not because the Jewish conspiracy is keeping me down. It's because I haven't sent my plays to them. So she mm. encouraged him to type them up neatly. She helped him and he sent his plays off and stuff. I wish they'd been accepted. He would have ended mm. up as a, as a playwright and theater critic in a small town rather than the monster he became. Mm-hmm. And Aristotle once said that we often turn against the people who helped us and we mm-hmm. turn against them because they saw us in our hour of need. So Elsa had seen, they were Elsa and Joey, they had all these like affectionate terms to each other. She had seen him when he was rock bottom and she extended a helping hand to bring him up and he couldn't bear that. After about a year and a half, two years, he began to turn against her and there were these mm-hmm. angry, fit young men and he loved the fact that with his quick, nasty tongue, he could dominate them. And these were the early representatives of what was then an extremely small Nazi party. And he mm-hmm. later became, he dropped Elsa. Uh, it's possible he had her family murdered. Uh, it's unclear. She disappears from the history books. And he, uh, he made the, uh, uh, the Nazi party thrive in Germany. And then in his early 30s, he was propaganda minister. Mm-hmm. The contrast. Contrast. Really, the contrast. <laughs> So we think of Franklin Roosevelt, who's a, a, a little bit older, uh, but similar generation, uh, like a, a little bit older. We think of Franklin Roosevelt as a great man, which he was, brought in social security, helped end the depression. He wasn't perfect by any means. Uh, the roundup of Japanese was a, a, a disgrace, which even the director of the FBI was against. Same with the head of naval intelligence. The director so, of the FBI being, being uh, Hoover. Hoover. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, somebody, somebody who, who is not considered to be a nice person in general for the people Correct. in the 60s. So, so, so FDR was guilty for that. It isn't like, oh, this was a consensus that everybody did. No, right. he, he was worse than other people. So FDR was not a perfect man. Yeah. But on the whole, he was great. He really pushed to get support for unions, uh, support for the common man, social security, uh, 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 mortgage relief. You know, people couldn't be thrown off. He, uh, but he didn't go to extremes. He said, look, I like bankers. I just don't want them to take excess profits. You know, I'm mm-hmm. not turning this into any dictatorship. We just have to be fair. So he was a great man. But when he, and he was really full of energy. But when he was young, he was not. So Franklin Roosevelt grew up in a really rich family, uh, maybe 100 miles uh, outside of New York City, uh, up not too far from uh, West Point, uh, up, mm-hmm. up in the Hudson, a Valley. And his family had done nothing except for live off inherited wealth for generation after generation after generation. And in his 20s, he became a congressman for, uh, not a national congressman in Washington, but in Albany, New York, for the state of, uh, of New York. And there was a woman there, uh, sort of a, an agitator and a, a union organizer named uh, Frances Perkins. And she said to him, look, we're trying to get a bill through the state legislature that will keep children from working more than 54 hours a week. Um, and, and also to make sure that they get paid properly if they are forced to, week, to, to, to work. And he had a steel rimmed eyeglasses. And he looked down his nose at her and say, too busy, too busy. He was kind of like the young Boris Johnson, the current British prime minister. <laughs> he, was, he was very manner. Say, too busy, piffle, waffle. I'm busy with other stuff. And a politician <laughs> that worked with him later who knew him at the time said, he was an arrogant little son of a bitch. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he had, he, because of his family connections, uh, Teddy Roosevelt had the same last name, very distant relation, like fifth or sixth cousin. But he had, because of the, the name, he got a job as the assistant head of the Navy. Mm-hmm. Uh, as, as a youngish man, and he was okay with that, but he was he was a fool. He married a woman who later became wonderful, but when they were first married, she was so spoiled that not only could Eleanor Roosevelt not cook, she'd grown up in a rich family also, she didn't know how to order food. She couldn't order food. When she started having kids, she found she had to tell the cooks what to do, and she didn't know how to do that. So really rich, spoiled <laughs> family. Um, and an arrogant and nasty, blah, blah, blah. When he was 39 years old, he was on a, a, an island off the coast of Maine, where his mumsy had bought him a, a, a little country resort. I think it had 29 bedrooms. That's, it was that sort of family. And he was a really fit guy. He used to run up the rigging in, uh, in, in US Navy ships. He, he loved the Navy. And his legs became sore and sore one afternoon. It got worse and worse. Day later, he couldn't move. And so he had polio. Uh, uh, now, it turns out if your legs are uh, paralyzed and you can't move them, or if you've ever like really broken a leg and have a cast, you can actually move around fairly well with crutches. You can just, you swing your hips from side to side and you, you can move around. If your hips are paralyzed, it's totally different. 
then your entire body is dead weight supported by your shoulders. It's almost impossible to move around. You're just wobbling. You can try the experiment. It's really, really hard. His hips were paralyzed. So he was paralyzed uh, from the waist down. Sexual function, as the doctor said, was still there. It's a slightly different nerve system, but he mm. couldn't move his hips. And, and, and for a while, he was totally incontinent. He really hit rock bottom. He tried to go to work one day. I describe it from the account of somebody who was with him. Right. And he just fell on his face on this marble floor. And it was humiliating. He just, he said, so he gave up. It was the uh, 1920s and the, the world of F. Scott Fitzgerald and the great Gaps, Gatsby. So he moved to a houseboat in Florida. He left his wife behind. He left his kids behind. He had a big family. And it was just a playboy with gin and martinis and stuff with other rich boys who had gone to Harvard or Yale. And they just passed time, a year, two years. They were uh, playboys around, girls who liked those sorts of people. It was a waste of a life. And then one day, uh, visiting on the ship, was a, a young woman from a working class area of Boston, a uh, summer town, uh, and, um, named Margaret Lehand. I had never heard of her. She later became effectively chief of staff in the White House. She was on the cover of Time Magazine. Women mm-hmm. were so written out of history when I was growing up, never heard of her. Anyways, so Margaret Lehand um, said to Roosevelt on the lifeboat, uh, sorry, on the, uh, on the houseboat, when she got to know him, what are you doing with your life? Why are you doing this? You're in your early forties. Uh, the polio doesn't affect your brain, doesn't affect the rest of your health. You can live for another 40 years. You can live into the 1970s. Are you just going to do this? Float around, mm-hmm. drink martinis, laugh at the sunset. What a waste of a life. And so he had hit rock bottom as Goebbels had hit rock bottom. Goebbels met a young, nice woman who was willing to offer help and show him a good feel. Goebbels went the other way. Mm-hmm. Roosevelt hit rock bottom. He met a woman who offered him a good direction and he took it. He started working with uh, therapy to help uh, other people with polio. He ended up uh, sort of, it sounds very much New Testament. He was massaging the feet of other people who had problems. And he realized he invested a lot of his money in that. He had screaming arguments with his wife about it. Uh, She didn't say, we should never use our inheritance elsewhere. As I mentioned, she also was somebody who changed and became a a great benevolent person later. Mm -hmm. Um, Because of him and because of Margaret Lehand, she didn't force him to change. We have this potential within us. We have a good side, we have a bad side. Uh, we all do. Most of us, our society channels us in a decent fashion. Roosevelt was fashioned to be not a total jerk, but just a lazy, selfish person and stuff. Mm-hmm. And when he hit rock bottom, he was lucky enough, two things happened. He met a woman who offered him and pointed him in the right direction. And there was something inside him, something which made him grasp onto that. So he was in real pain for much of his life. In the White House, uh, he would occasionally, he would fall at speeches, he would fall flat on his face. And it's incredibly embarrassing. Photographers at that time were very different from now. Nobody would photograph those accidents. Uh, he had to be carried around. He was, you could be mm-hmm. humiliated. Who, they often say, who does, how many people does it make to, that are needed to make you feel bad about yourself? It's two. The other person giving you these abusive comments and you for believing it. When he mm-hmm. would fall in the White House, he'd say, oh, it's kind of silly. Can't move my legs. Um, and people would help him up. And he'd say, great, you know, let's all have a martini together and tell me more about those uh, plans for Social Security. So Mm -hmm. he used that experience in a good way. And uh, the contrast between the two, I was so delighted when I came up with Mm -hmm. that idea for Mm -hmm. uh, the end of the book. I've been um, I've been a writer for over 40 years. It's incredibly long. It's pretty much all I've done more than that. And I've had a few moments when things have come together really well. Everything's been okay. I'm a competent enough writer. But there's been just a few moments when I realized I didn't feel writing was coming from me. I felt there was a truth waiting out there. I was really lucky to carve away what got between us and the truth, a veil. And I could Mm -hmm. see it, like seeing the spear around the earth where truth lay. And I could Mm -hmm. feel and see the story of Goebbels and FDR, maybe because I could feel and see those polarities inside all of us. And the writing just flew, flew, flew. And I love that turn. I love that notion at the beginning, Goebbels was on top. And look down on FDR as a nothing, as a minion, as a failure, as representative of a, of a useless country. And his army was strong, the German army. And by the end of the book, it had all shifted. And Goebbels was like a hunted rat in the ruins of a highly bombed Berlin. And he couldn't mm-hmm. believe it. Occasionally, when they brought down American fighters and bombers, they found that the pilots were Black Americans and Polish Americans and Italian Americans. And they were really brave and terrific. And he said, how could this be happening? It was like when the Wicked Witch of the West, the Wicked Witch of the Wizard of Oz dies, but this was real life. God, it was a relief writing that. 
And it was, uh, you know, it, it shows in the writing. That was, it was very gripping. Uh, the story, of best, best insight into Goebbels I've ever read either. I mean, just wonderfully done. And we're going to return to one of those themes in just a second, but I want to cover Leo DeRocher. Nice guys finish last mm. in just a couple of minutes. And then we want to get to a, that, that, uh, a part of the big theme, which I, I wanted to talk to you about because I, I see it in your writing. So uh, we're, we're both from the Chicago area. We both were, were raised on losing, uh, the, the Chicago Cup was losing all the time. And then it got so close in 1969. And Leo DeRocher, who was a jerk of a, <laughs> of a coach, why don't you just tell a short story? The guy who says nice guys finish last ended up yes. being a lousy guy who finished last, right? <laughs> yes, that's what's amazing. We think a lot of people say, yeah, yeah, David, you're writing this book about people being nice and hugging. And I say, no, that's not the book I'm writing. Yeah. Nice and hugging by itself won't do it. Love can do a lot. Love and determination can do a real lot, but you need that determination. You need the street smarts. So Leo DeRocher was a cynical SOB. He was, mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he, was, he, he was a decent baseball player. He wasn't great. He was uh, on some of the great teams in the 1920s, then became a coach and manager and stuff. Um, and, uh, but he was quick and he had, so he was relatively short for baseball players of the time. He had that funny Canadian, uh, French Canadian name, uh, in mm -hmm. French, it'd be Du Rocher, and people mm -hmm. made fun of him. He called himself De Rocher, trying to be tough. So he had a certain amount of abuse. But the only thing he had was his uh, toughness and his ability to cheat. So when he was mm -hmm. sliding at the second base, he, he was a quick uh, shortstop, but not incredible. He's sliding to the second base, he'd put his spikes up. And even if he, whether he was out or in, you know what he would do? He'd leave a little gift for the, the guy at, the, at second base, shortstop or second baseman there, he would scrape the spikes really hard, not just against the soft part of the muscle, but right on the front, right against the, uh, uh, the shin, where it really yeah. cut through and stuff. He was a real SOB. Um, and he encouraged his players to be like that. And in uh, 1948, 1949, one time he referred to another team as, you know, they're, they're nice, they're gonna lose. And a sports writer uh, put that in the headline, nice guys finish last, says DeRosa. And it became mm. a phrase. And DeRocher used to tell people, what can I say? It's true. It's true. Yeah, it should be different, but it's true. Thing is, so that wasn't entirely true. So he had some ups and downs in his career, including some great successes and some great losses. And near the end of his career, when he was still a fit guy, his pinnacle was going to be the Chicago Cubs. If there's anybody from the Chicago area uh, who's been a fan since the wonderful moment in the World Series, you will know what pain is. It's like, it's like people support Chelsea in the British Football League. I mean, you know pain if you were a, a Cubs supporter. And I was a Cubs supporter. It sounds like you suffered the uh, same yeah. fate. Anyways, it turns out in the mid-1960s, it's going to turn around. Because the Cubs, that, those, that era, had some great players. They had the great Ernie Banks. They had uh, really great defensive players. They had really good hitters. They were one of the strongest teams in the National League East. They were really strong. And in 1969 in particular, and they were playing against ridiculous, there was an expansion team called the New York Mets who could hear of such a thing. It was, it was a, a recent new team. It had been only put together, I think in 1962. They were always in the cellar. They were very mediocre and stuff. So Chicago was on top in 1969. They were gonna win the pennant. They were gonna go all the way. But the thing is with any other coach manager, they would have gone all the way. But DeRocher insisted nice guys finish last. So he was really abusive to his players. He wasn't just, some coaches, they drive you, come on, you're, yeah, you can do better. It wasn't like that. So the shortstop of Chicago at the time was Ron Santo. And he was Italian American, he had diabetes. And at that era, it's so different from today, you had to hide the fact you had diabetes. You know, you couldn't, mm -hmm. you couldn't talk about it and stuff. And so DeRocher would guy him like that. Oh, you're getting tired. You know why you're getting tired? Because you're Italian. And instead of just making a joke in some way, he would really go into it and he'd say, you know, your mother's weak, your, your dad, Mm. the coward i mean read down so he would do one time santo grabbed him by the throat you effing say that again i will kill you santo <laughs> he wasn't just being teased or pushed he hated his guts and mm. so he pushed the players without break ernie banks was one of the great players in american baseball mid 20th century but he was getting an older man he needed breaks they there was no air conditioning at the time in, in the on the field hot muggy summers in chicago it's not beautiful the players were getting weak and then he was really abusive to the umpires. And not just, I'm gonna stand up for my men, but he would try to get them quietly and really, really like whisper you know, cruel things about their family and, and their wives, but not in a joking way. Um, somebody said that uh, whether DeRocher managed to unite um, uh, the Cubs against the umpires, he certainly united the umpires against the Cubs. And opposing players hated so much the way that he treated them uh, with all the cheating and, and stuff that they would bring their very best game against Chicago. 
and he was he tried to present himself as a charming curmudgeon he wasn't one mm. time there was a, a fan who said hey leo come on you're not doing that well leo you're not doing that well so leo nodded to an off-duty policeman who was near him grabbed that fan when nobody was around took him to a closed room this was before chicago it was in new york uh, mm. but when he was uh, managing took him to a closed room locked the door and then held the guy from behind and Leo started punching him. Derosha started punching him. And not just, ah, you son of a bitch, don't say it on me, punching him once in the stomach, let him go. Started punching him in the face. Turns out, if you punch somebody in the face, your knuckles really hurt. And they're usually okay. He punched and he punched and he broke the guy's jaw. The guy couldn't breathe. He was choking on his blood and he kept on punching. So there was a court case about it later. The guy took him to court. And the policeman who had followed Derosha at first was calling out, Leo, what are you doing? Leo, stop, for God. So he wasn't a cute, charming guy. He said, this is how things work. If somebody's weaker than you, crush them. Anyways, the weakest player, the weakest manager that he saw in baseball was a guy named Gil Hodges who ran the New York Mets. And he said, Hodges was known as being one of the nicest guys in baseball. i oh, sorry, one of the fairest guys. So he said, Puh, he's a softy. Well, Leo DeRocher had spent his life playing a game where grown men dress up in little children's outfits made of like felt and stuff. And they hit a ball <laughs> around. Uh, I love baseball. Gil Hodges yeah. was the son of a coal miner and had fought in uh, the Battle of Guadalcanal and was uh, decorated for valor in combat. He mm -hmm. just didn't go on about it. He didn't brag about it. So he was. He was dead fair to his players in New York. If somebody did something wrong, he would discipline them. Somebody was really lazy, take them out of the game. Wouldn't it be mean that, you know, didn't perform tonight, you're out, even in front of a, a full stadium. But the next morning say, yeah, that was yesterday. I trust you, you're a good guy, you learned your lesson, you'll be a great player. He was like that consistently. And mm -hmm. the Mets beat the Cubs. The Cubs started losing this incredible losing streak. I know, because I was there, I was cleaning the yeah. stadium. I didn't always finish my school days. Uh, 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 <laughs> September of 1969. Uh, <laughs> young David was ill and at home, quite a lot at home. Yeah. <laughs> The Cubs folded, and the Cubs folded because his players hated him. This guy yeah. who said nice guys finish last, he himself, he didn't finish last, but he lost to the Mets, who won the pennant. They triumphed yeah. over Chicago, not by being soft, not by just hugging and telling stories. Uh, you get the uh, these medals for Valor in Guadalcanal, you're not a softie, but by being fair and decent. Mm -hmm. Cubs lost, Mets won. Well, I want to take just a couple more minutes um, before we wrap this up. Uh, because uh, we met 12 years ago when you came uh, to San Francisco to talk about your book, Passionate Minds, about Voltaire and his mistress, uh, Madame du Chocolat, who was a brilliant woman. Um, as you write about it in the book, she was the one who translated uh, Newton into French right at the time that it was happening. Um, so I've seen that there's, a, there's a, um, a pattern here. You admired this mistress of Voltaire. You admired the woman who Goebbels was with uh, before he, he got married. Um, you admired Missy Lehand, uh, who, who made Roosevelt into a better man than his wife was doing. Um, and, and so I found it fascinating at the end when I got to the acknowledgments that you mentioned uh, Kathleen. Um, yeah. and, and so I, I was just wondering if you, 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 you talk about uh, in this sort of middle road thing, but you're not following a set of rules about society, you're following a, a set of emotions, how to do something. Totally, uh, the, the heart comes first. And I'm, I'm, I'm very yeah. touched that you mentioned Kathleen, that the, the yeah. woman I dedicate the book to passed away uh, just a few years ago. And I lived with her through my twenties, a, a lovely mm. woman. She was uh, half French, half English. We lived in France uh, for, for 10 years. And I wasn't awful to her, but I didn't treat her fairly. And it's mm. uh, stuck on my conscience the whole time. We, uh, we really should have it's hard to say in words. Uh, who knows why a relationship ends? But um, mm. I wasn't honest. I wasn't consistent. She, she was a good person. Not, not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. So I, in the acknowledgments, normally acknowledgments in a book, people say these cute little stories. Oh, I want to yeah. thank my editor who's perfect and my, you know, uh, these friends who helped me. And it, it's all true. And I have charming, funny things in the rest of the acknowledgments. But for her, I wanted to tell the truth. So mm. I wrote uh, the first four paragraphs of the acknowledgments. Took me five weeks. My editors, yeah. in a polite way, said, David, why don't you get on with it? But I, <laughs> the truth. I didn't want to tell just cute stories. And I didn't yeah. want to overdo and be maudlin, but I just wanted to honestly capture this person who's no longer with us and what was going on. So those are my favorite four paragraphs, I think, in, 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 in anything I've written, because I feel I, I captured it. Uh, mm -hmm. All of us have diverse. So there, there's two reasons I write about women so much. One is I grew up with uh, strong women. 
I have five mm. big sisters. I had five big sisters. Uh, uh, yeah. strong, so one of them passed away. And, you know, Midwest, it, people are people. So I grew up with strong women. So I'm, I'm open to, you know, to seeing strong women, strong men, interesting, just good people. So in that sense, I'm not prejudiced. Uh, it, it's at, at least explicitly in, in that direction. But there's something f- further. All of us have parts. I mean, most of us don't have the nasty parts that Goebbels does, but we have better and worse parts. We have this and that. And very often our partners are really important. Sometimes it's our career. Sometimes, weirdly, it's our own children. But often it's our partners who will help lock, pull us from one channel into another, one mm-hmm. channel into another. Uh, at one point I talk in the book about was America racist in the late 1930s? And when Jesse Owens went to New York after winning the, uh, doing so well in the 1936 Berlin mm-hmm. Olympics, he, uh, he could barely, he was barely led into the hotel. He had to go to a side entrance, I think, in the, Wal- the new Waldorf Astoria, Astoria mm-hmm. in New York City. It's terrible racism. On the other hand, he was in New York because of a huge parade where several hundred thousand New Yorkers, black mm-hmm. and white and Latino, everybody came together to celebrate him. So was America at that time racist or non-racist? Answer is obvious, it was both. Both potentialities mm-hmm. were there. Good leadership can bring out one direction. It's like recessive genes. Some things mm-hmm. bring out a recessive, one recessive gene. Other things bring out another. So the same for me that I noticed, uh, very astute. I mean, you pointed out it's often female characters. Sometimes it can be male mentors. But mm-hmm. we're, we're mixed. We have these different potentials. And our life choices, our partners, really, really important. I think a lot of people feel that when they're dating and stuff in their 20s or 30s or you know, mm. you can take clearly at any age, but young people feel that because they know that they're amorphous. They can go in different directions. And with certain settings, with some people, you become an intellectual. With others, you just fun loving and enjoy service of life. With others, mm. you find that you're really committing at food banks and doing that. With others, you're into eco-activism. It's hard to be very different from the people around you. And it's easy to be pulled in that direction. And so what we want to do is find out somebody who brings out, brings out the best rather than the worst. Mm-hmm. And I, I think um, part of your particular four cases there, uh, your own uh, Voltaire's and, and uh, Goebbels and, and Roosevelt, I think what it shows that people should be a little bit lighter about, you know, it doesn't have to be a commitment from one time for the rest of your life and so on. You can have an enormous impact on somebody in an illegitimate relationship if you're just treating them fairly and in, in, in this mean, uh, decent way in this not mean, decent way, um, and that you can have that effect on all kinds of people in your life in a small way, but the ones that are your partners, the ones that you're really involved in, you can have a, a major difference in their lives. And I know, I mean, just to use Eleanor and, 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 and Roosevelt as an, and FDR as an example, I'm sure Eleanor was furious about the, the relationship, but it also affected her life for the better too. You nailed it. it um, yeah. Seeing her husband become a decent person, being seeing him being open to people from different backgrounds, she herself became uh, the first time she met Felix Frankfurter, a uh, brilliant uh, law professor, became uh, who Roosevelt put on the Supreme Court. She wrote to Franklin, "Oh, I had to sit next to a Jew," and mm-hmm. he said, "Well, you know, let's sit next to him again, and you'll learn something." And yeah. she did. <laughs> See, that's the great thing. Instead of saying, "Oh, she had this one negative comment or view and should be." Uh, uh, it w- that was her forever. People are changeable. Uh, uh, was it, who was it? There was one of the famous uh, American senators who ran in 1948 on the individual states' right party, uh, mm-hmm. which encouraged uh, lynching. It was pro-lynching. Later right. in South Carolina, he got, Berman, re-elected. Yeah. Yeah, he got re-elected with a strong black vote. Somebody said, how? He said, I changed. People can yeah. change. It's beautiful. Right. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, th- that's not to say that everybody needs a mistress. Uh, it's just, okay, no, no, no. Yeah. yeah, but, but everybody, everybody is advantaged by having people um, be decent to them and fair. Um, a school teacher. We often remember a school absolutely. teacher. There's often, it's, it can happen at any age, but there's times in your life. Uh, I, I was just giving some talks to, to the British army this week and people talked about the instructors they had when they were brand new recruits, their first mm. week, their first month, and mm. you're wide open to experience that. First week at university, first days in a new high school, the, the first month at a new job. Mentors, male, female, whatever it is, old, mm-hmm. young, they can really have a strong effect on you when you're open. And that's the power of decency in our world, whether the world has gone mean or not gone mean, you know, and everybody can exercise that power. And uh, great book. Another great book, David. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. With pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you again.